Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creep Pasta, and before we get started on tonight's wacky little story, I'm gonna let you know about tonight's author, Cryptic Nightmares. You guys have seen Cryptic Nightmares show up plenty of other times on the channel. More specifically, you've heard him pop up in My Tiny Town Just Got Put on Lockdown. That series is still running here on the channel, but you can get a hold of the novel versions of part one, two, and three on Amazon right now in the link in the description down below. Strongly suggest it, because you don't wanna miss out on how it ends. And now, on to tonight's story. Cryptic sat in the empty hot tub underneath the massive oak tree in the yard. Surrounded by snow from the recent freak winter storm, he peered through the old aviator goggles at the sunrise. His outfit of half-laced military boots, a winter coat, and matching speedo did well at keeping him warm. It was nearly May, and the uncanny fall of snow the previous day let Cryptic know everything he needed to know about the coming days. Gary chattered from the front porch as Cryptic refilled his red gas can with aged bourbon. He glanced back for a second at the little ferret on the porch before resting the now-filled can on the hot tub's edge and inserting the long end of a three-foot crazy straw into it. He took a long pull from the straw as he gazed into his neighbor's backyard. It was nearly a quarter mile between the two houses, but Cryptic sat in the empty hot tub at the edge of the property line, watching the old woman's place. The thoughts running through his mind were preparing him for the same argument he has had with Lady Snickerbottom every spring. She was in no way a lady, and it disgusted Cryptic that her parents had had the audacity to name her as such. Her husband, Rufus, had passed away a few years ago, and since that day, Lady had sadly gotten worse and worse in attitude. Rufus had seemed to be her voice of reason, yet without him, it left her unbridled, and her descent into Karenness began to increase exponentially. Cryptic was waiting for her to exit the house. He was waiting to see her repeat the same action that he had seen her do every day for the past week. Gary chattered and flopped around on the porch as if he was ready for the argument also. Cryptic looked back to watch him curl into a tight ball, chatter, then pop onto his feet and prance around with explosive energy. I know, I know, just calm down, you little weasel, I got this. Gary chattered angrily, turned back towards the front door, and ran headfirst into the wall instead. Then he stood back up, shook himself like a dog, then sped off into the house. That thing has about two brain cells left, and he's always trying to lend three out, Cryptic said under his breath as he turned back to Rufus and Lady's yard. He sat there for another thirty minutes as the three-foot straw began sucking air from the bottom of the gas can full of bourbon. Then, just before Cryptic stood to refill the gas can, he saw it. Corn, nuts and seed flew out of his neighbor's backyard. This act immediately caused a handful of squirrels to flood the woman's yard. She had been feeding them for the past week, and Cryptic knew nothing good would come of it. He had to find a way to stop her before the glorified tree rats overran the place. Cryptic stood to talk to the difficult woman. He stepped from the hot tub, tripped, fell on his face, then quickly rose to his feet and wobbled a bit. Apparently a gallon of bourbon at eight in the morning seemed to hinder his sense of balance. Carrying a flask in one hand and a nerf gun in the other, he charged Lady's house, hoping to confront her about the squirrels before she retreated inside and ignored him. A few little chatters from the ground level let Cryptic know that Gary had left the porch and was running alongside him. This pleased him because other than the ferret's sworn duty to repel beavers from the property, Gary was rather skilled at keeping the tree rat menace at bay. As the two of them approached the back door of the neighbor's house, the ten or twelve squirrels formed a semicircle around the supply of food on the ground. The shifty little bastards began to flick their tails and bark at them before Cryptic called out, Lady! I know you saw me coming. We need to have a talk about you feeding and attracting these arboreal demons to the area. Her response came from within the house out of an open window. These are my friends, Cryptic. Now you need to get off my property before I call the police. Now get! You drunken mallard enthusiast. Gary scampered over to Cryptic as he began to grumble and grind his teeth with anger at the old woman. As the ferret reached his leg, he bit Cryptic, causing him to look down. Ow! What the fuck is this? What? Gary stared up at Cryptic and chattered before running off towards the squirrel's tribe leader. He only knew that it was the leader by the acorn headdress resting gently on the creature's head. As Gary and the squirrel squeaked and barked back and forth to each other for a few minutes, he returned with a worried look and then took off towards the house. Cryptic, realizing that negotiations had gone shaky at best, turned to follow the little ferret. 
He turned, stumbled, and nearly crashed to the ground, but caught himself and continued after Gary. They sat at the kitchen table. A bowl of tiger shrimp sat between them. A look of skepticism covered Cryptic's face as he looked at Gary. On the other hand, Gary felt no awkward tension and casually snatched one of those massive shrimp from the bowl. Instead of eating it, he added it to his pile of hidden food that sat in plain view at the corner of the table. Cryptic was the first to speak, but before saying a word, he pulled a jug of moonshine from the cabinet, poured a packet of Kool-Aid into it, and shook the jug vigorously. He finally spoke as he retrieved his crazy straw glasses from the drawer, knowing the glasses make you look more sophisticated. When were you going to tell me you spoke squirrel to knees? Gary looked shocked at the accusation. How long have you been in bed with those... tree vermin? Answer me! Cryptic shouted as he threw a shrimp, bouncing it off the table near Gary and causing it to splat against the back wall. Gary sheepishly pulled two shrimp from his pile in the corner and laid them out on the table. Two? Two what? Two weeks? Two days? Who are you working for? Cryptic shouted again, before taking a strikingly long pull of the grape Kool-Aid moonshine. The ferret laid down next to the shrimp and cuddled up next to it, pretending to fall asleep. Then suddenly he sprang up and bit down on the shrimp, thrashing it back and forth. Ah, little double agent action, I see. Gary stopped and smiled, then proceeded to bounce around the table with an abundance of excitement before getting too close to the edge and falling off. He hit the ground with a loud thud and a confused look, then scurried off into the living room and behind the couch. Cryptic shook his head at the clumsy animal before taking another long pull from the straw. He then snatched up the partially eaten shrimp from the table, dunked it in the mixture of ketchup and mayonnaise, then pulled the meat from the tail with his teeth. For the next three days, Cryptic woke up early in the morning to stare out at the barren fields that seemed to mirror his aversion for effort. He never watched the field itself, but more so the neighbor's yard, where he watched the crazed woman throw out food, and the number of squirrels slowly grew. Something is going on over there, Gary. I don't know where it's going, but I feel it's nowhere good. Gary suddenly began chattering wildly and hopping around, running into walls. Cryptic looked confused and concerned at the little crackhead weasel. What the hell's your problem, you little idiot? Just as Gary ran headfirst into a chair leg, Cryptic turned around and noticed out the window precisely what the little creature was excited about. Vincent, his beloved mallard, and the rest of the ducks that returned to his sanctuary year after year. A tear of joy ran solemnly down his face at the sight of the birds returning for the spring. He jumped for joy but his socks slipped on the tile, causing him to come crashing to the ground. He bounced his head off the counter on his way down. He awoke from his involuntary nap in the middle of the night. As he looked around the room, touching the trickle of blood on his forehead, he noticed a plethora of beady little eyes staring at him, menacingly from the windows. The squirrels had mounted a reconnaissance mission, he searched the darkness for any trace of his guard weasel. After hearing some odd noises, he realized that Gary was aggressively trying to make love to the dish sponge in the sink. He realized that he needed to take matters into his own hands. He shouted and flailed his arms in an attempt to scare the squirrel squad away. When that failed to work, he pulled the sponge away from Gary and threw it at the window. Only a soft pat sounded as the sponge hit the window, but it was enough to scatter the tree rats. The clock on the microwave read 3.30 in the morning, and now that the vermin had scattered, Cryptic thought it would be a decent time to start cooking breakfast. It was much earlier than he usually rose for the day, and with the light of the moon still out, he chose to leave the lights off and cook in the darkness. After placing a skillet in the stove, Gary scampered up to him and bit his finger before he could open the fridge door. Hey! What the fuck? I'll punch you across the room, you little asshole! After the words left his mouth, he realized that blood still trickled slowly down his face. Okay, clean up first. I get you. Still don't need to be a dick and bite me over it. Gary chattered and bounced his front paws in a stomping motion. No, it's not the only way to get my attention. You could learn to pour me a drink for one, instead of being a lazy fur noodle. Gary chattered again, then took off after where the sponge had landed, most likely to resume violating Cryptic's last remaining dish-cleaning utensil. You know that sponge will never love you back, Cryptic called out just as Vincent, followed by two other ducks, waddled into the house. Don't worry, I'll get my own drink then. He pulled out and took off the lid of a fishbowl of Everclear from the cupboard, 
He poured the contents into a camelback, slung it over his shoulders, and kept the mouthpiece securely between his lips. A few large gulps later, he tended to the blood on his face. As he cleaned the wound on his forehead, he noticed something out of the window that instantly infuriated him. In the light of the moon, he could see Snicklebottom shamble onto his property, tossing out something along the ground. Unfortunately, the darkness was too great and his vision too blurry from the grain alcohol to discern precisely what it was. However, he had a solid suspicion she was throwing seeds and nuts into his yard, drawing the squirrels to cross enemy lines. Vincent! Perimeter check! We have invaders! With a soft quack, he and his two cohorts turned and waddled quickly out of the house. Within 30 seconds, he could see as the birds took flight. They flew towards the sketchy old woman before turning and instead landing gracefully into the pond. Cryptic took another long swig from the Everclear mouthpiece before muttering to himself, Well, shit. Breakfast would have to wait. Having been distracted, blood still ran down his cheek as he grasped the ankle of his defensive mannequin leg. He ran full tilt toward Lady, chasing her off of his property and only stumbling twice on the way. As he heard her door shut behind her after she ran inside, Cryptic took another long swig, then howled at the moon in triumph. His celebration lasted only a few seconds before realizing that he was standing outside his property and had become surrounded by a tribe of squirrels with a taste for blood and vengeance. The violent history between Cryptic and the squirrels was hazy, even to him. Both sides blamed the other for what happened that day so many years ago, Generations of squirrels passed down the tale, pinning Cryptic as the villain. Cryptic blamed a member of the tribe for his indecisiveness when crossing the road at 11 at night that day. Although the squirrel tribe had lost a leader to Cryptic's geometro tires, a fragile truce was still made. The validity and enforcement of that truce had been called into question as of late. The squirrels would remain out of Cryptic's property, and he would, in turn, avoid conflict with a growing army. Cryptic's heart sank with fear. He realized that off his own property and carrying a weapon aggressively towards the army had unwittingly broken the non-verbal Squirrel Treaty of 2014. Dozens and dozens of furry tails flicked in the moonlight, and a single bark from their leader caused the rest of the group to fall into a frenzy. He backed quickly towards the property line, swinging the leg at any rodent beginning to advance towards him. He took another long pull from the camelback, long enough to begin sucking air. The swinging of the mannequin leg began to fail at deterring the squirrels, and the first of them leapt to attack. Landing on his chest, the furry little rodent soldier took a bite before bounding away again. Cryptic swung the leg, hoping for an easy hit. However, the only contact was the leg hitting himself hard in the chest, nearly knocking the wind out of him. He began to panic, and just as he turned to sprint back to the house, he hit the edge of the hot tub in the middle of his thigh, causing him to topple over into the basin. He screamed in fear, expecting the rodents to descend upon him, biting and clawing, until there was little more than a skeleton left of him. And suddenly, flutters of wings sounded above him, and the ducks quickly drove the squirrels back into the crazed arms of Lady, who was waiting just outside her back door. Cryptic peeked over the edge of the hot tub and drunkenly called out, This isn't over, Lady! My attack ducks will... Vincent pecked Cryptic in the face as if to tell him to keep his mouth shut and not antagonize. Oh, fuck, he said, before pushing Vincent aside and continuing. This is just beginning. You have been warned. Without waiting for a response, he rose out of the back of the hot tub and stumbled back towards his house. Walking through the door, he told Vincent thank you before the bird flew off to wherever it had planned to sleep for the rest of the morning. Laying passed out next to the sink sponge was Gary on the floor of the kitchen. Cryptic rolled his eyes at the sight, but it caused the room to start spinning. He lifted his hand to hold his head in an attempt to slow the dizziness. Instead, he pulled his head down and remembered he still had yet to finish bandaging his head. After loosely wrapping gauze around his head, he opened the fridge to resume cooking breakfast. Becoming distracted again, he removed the camelback and refilled it with Everclear from the fishbowl. Proud of himself for filling the pack without spilling any, he put it back over his shoulders, took a big swig, and sat down in front of the open fridge door to decide what to cook. He settled for a dozen standard chicken eggs, no longer having the luxury of ostrich eggs since Sarah had betrayed him and impaled herself on the pitchfork. Reaching out to pull them off the shelf, Cryptic fell forward and passed out with his head 
in the open fridge. When he finally awoke, Gary was pushing the sponge towards him and chattering softly. He picked his head up and wiped the drool from his lips before taking another pull on the mouthpiece. Gary nudged the sponge towards Cryptic again and looked up at him. What's that supposed to mean? Cryptic said as his eyes began to focus. No, Gary, I don't want to fuck your sponge. You know, that's the only sponge we had, right? Gary cocked his head to the side before picking up the sponge and running off into the back room with it. Shaking his head at the little weasel, he grabbed the leftover meatloaf from the open fridge to eat his breakfast. As he sat at the table, the entire collection of eight ducks waddled into the house and rested in a circle around the coffee table in the living room. Cryptic watched as the ducks began tearing up small pieces of paper and arranging them in small groups or seemingly very specific locations on the table. It took him far longer than he wished to admit to realize, but the ducks were having a war room briefing. He quickly finished the rest of the meatloaf and staggered over to the living room to get a better look at the table. The ducks clearly knew something big was coming. More than Cryptic knew, for sure. Standing in the living room, Cryptic was able to see out of the kitchen window. What he saw caused his heart to race and fear to ball up in his chest. Lady's property held hundreds, if not thousands, of squirrels, each one standing at attention near the property line, looking towards Cryptic's house. Are they attacking? Vincent, is it go time? Without waiting for any form of answer, he scrambled back to his bedroom, crashing and shuffling, and banging could be heard from within the room. Only a few moments later, Cryptic emerged once again, a broken set of football shoulder pads missing one shoulder, a Richard Nixon Halloween mask, a jock strap including a cup, one hockey leg guard, and a pair of combat boots with laces missing was all he wore. As he walked back into the living room, he carried his mannequin leg as if it was a mighty sword. He sat on the couch and retrieved the box of flypaper that he kept on the end table next to the empty box of tissue paper. As he wrapped the strips of sticky paper around the thigh of the plastic leg, a thought popped in his mind. Hey, hold this for a minute, Cryptic said as he tossed the leg to Gary, knocking him to the ground and subsequently sticking him to the floor. He ran through the house and nearly tripped down the stairs as he released a sinister cackle from his chest. Throwing open the door at the bottom of the steps, he looked out over his mold and fungus farm. Various patches of different molds and mushrooms covered nearly two-thirds of the basement. He perused his selection until stopping and grinning wildly at the destroying angels flourishing in the corner. Thinking that they would most definitely do the trick, he plucked handfuls of the spongy mushrooms, intending to mix the deadly substance in with a mixture of food. With his handful of poisonous shrooms, he began to retreat back up the stairs not before picking three large moral mushrooms to cook for later, and a modest handful of stargazers. When he returned to the kitchen, he set the morals on the stove and poured himself a tall glass of his favorite moonshine from under the counter. He dropped the stargazers and a few slices of lemon into the glass and got to work mixing up a paste of seeds, berries, nuts, and the destroying angels. He would sneak out under the light of the moon and distribute squirrel feeders filled with the mixture around Lady's yard. Just as Cryptic sat at the kitchen table to concoct his poison mixture, he heard a strange whimpering sound. Looking around the floor, where it had seemingly come from, he realized that Gary was still stuck to the floor under the flypaper-covered mannequin leg. Reluctantly, Cryptic stood back up and pulled the leg from the floor, and then pulled Gary from the flypaper. After tossing the ferret onto the couch, he returned to the kitchen table. As Cryptic mixed up the poison, Gary climbed his pants, then shirt, and finally managed to reach the top of the table. Gary snagged some of the seeds and berries from the pile before Cryptic could mix them into the batch. Cryptic began to reprimand the little weasel, but was cut off by Gary chattering back angrily as he backed away from the piles. He hopped and argued as he reversed away from Cryptic, protesting that he can get to keep the small morsels of food before backing up too far and falling off the table. He hit the ground and released the seeds and berries, that he had stole, causing them to fly into the air before rolling away on the hardwood. Without retrieving his treasures, he quickly returned to his feet and scampered off back towards the ducks, who were still quacking softly to each other as they formulated their battle plans. Cryptic simply rolled his eyes at the stupidity of Gary's actions and took a significant gulp of his drink, swallowing two of the stargazers whole. He quickly finished the rest of his poison traps and placed them by the door in preparation for deployment after the sun went down. 
While Cryptic finished his alcohol-infused mushroom drink, he sliced and cooked the morals on the stove. Fried mushrooms are always a favorite of his. Gary, on the other hand, wanted no part of this meal and continued to bite at the one hockey leg guard that Cryptic was wearing. After kicking him away for the tenth time, Cryptic finally yelled out at him. God damn it, what? What do you want? What do you want to eat then? I know you don't want fried mushrooms, so what? Gary looked up at Cryptic for a second, then ran off to the other side of the kitchen, retrieving the dish sponge and resuming an aggressive attempt at fornicating with it. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Vincent and two other ducks fly past the window, causing him to realize that they had ended their briefing and left the house. He wondered what conclusions and plans they had come to about the army of squirrels sitting angrily at the edge of the property. Cryptic knew that he would soon find out anyway. The chattering and barking from the squirrels grew deafening, and he knew there was no way to delay the inevitable much longer. As the sun faded over the horizon and the land became only illuminated by the moonlight, the squirrels had quieted. Now was the moment. Pulling a tie-dyed sheet over himself in an attempt to appear invisible to the abhorrent rodents, he snatched up all the poison-filled feeders and opened the warped and waving door to the outside. The moonshine and mushroom mixture he had downed earlier was clearly starting to have an effect. Cryptic immediately tripped and fell to the ground as he walked through the doorway to the sound of hissing. Looking back to see what had caused him to fall, a smile formed on his face. Countless troops of possums had arrived. He realized that Vincent had left earlier to call in a favor from the Alliance. Cryptic shushed as the possums returned to his feet and bounded off into the darkness towards Lady's house. Vincent, Gary, and the newly recruited army of possums sat on the porch staring at the darkness of the night sky. It took nearly five minutes before Gary chattered and squeaked, then grabbed one of the poison feeders left on the ground and began to drag it across the yard. Various possums followed suit and grabbed the remainder of the feeders and followed Gary towards the neighbor's yard. Vincent simply shook his head at the thought of Cryptic cackling as he ran off into the night, having completely forgotten to retrieve the feeders from the ground after his fall. The next morning, Cryptic leapt from his car bed with the excitement of seeing how much damage his late-night plan had caused. The sudden movement startled Gary, causing him to fall off the toilet seat that he had been sleeping on and thud against the inside of the dry bowl. When Cryptic reached the window that looked out towards Lady's house, he expected to see masses of poison and dead squirrels. What he saw, however, was angry but seemingly well-fed masses of leaf-wearing branch hoppers lined up along the property line. Little did Cryptic know that the same mushrooms that would have ended his life in mere hours had little to no effect on the tree rats. He also noticed the horde of possums in his yard gnawing sticks into fine points and crafting weapons. Well, Gary, my plan failed. Looks like we have to do this the old-fashioned way, he said, as he grabbed the sticky flypaper-wrapped mannequin leg. As he moved towards the door, taking a deep breath and beginning to prepare himself to step out into the fray, he glanced back at Gary. Gary stood there adorned with a miniature football helmet and carrying his dish sponge. Cryptic placed the drink helmet on his head that he had just filled with moonshine. He took a long pull at the straw to prime the burning liquid into his system. Just before Cryptic could speak to the little ferret, a voice could be heard from outside. The time has come, Cryptic! Your bones will feed my army. I'm taking your land. We both know this has been a long time coming. Cryptic's eyes widened at the sound of Lady's screeching maniacal voice. He kicked the door open and stepped through, swinging the mannequin leg onto his shoulder. Vincent quacked out what seemed to be orders at the possums under his command. Fear rose in Cryptic's throat at the sight of just how many squirrels had accumulated under the command of his neighbor. No less than a thousand, he guessed. As they all chattered and barked, he took another long pull from the straw, draining more moonshine from the reservoirs on the side of the helmet, and washing as much of the fear back down his throat as he could. He held out his leg, looking like Babe Ruth calling his home run. As he began to yell out the best battle cry that he could think of, he was cut off by Lady before a sound could escape his lips with her own. Once more onto the branch, she yelled as she held up the random stick that she was using as a makeshift wizard staff. Somewhat disgruntled at being interrupted before he could get his own war cry out, Cryptic took another pull from the straw dangling near his lips. 
Gary tossed the sponge aside and scampered past him. By the time he hit the bottom of the steps, Vincent quacked loudly, and the two yards erupted in a graphic display of possum and squirrel violence. Blood sprayed, fur flew, and after a quick moment of shock at the sudden escalation, Cryptic held the leg over his head and charged. The squirrels flooded like a tidal wave into Cryptic's yard. Their numbers felt vastly overwhelming, but he knew that there was only one thing that he could do. He staggered to wind up his swing just as the wave of squirrels came within distance. He swung the leg, connecting with three of the squirrels that jumped to attack. The impact cracked and thudded against each of their three bodies. As he held the leg in front of his face, he realized that all three bodies had stuck to the flypaper. Knowing he didn't have enough time to remove them, he swung again, connecting squirrels with squirrels. Before letting the panic get to him, he swung again, only this time missing completely and falling to the ground. Just before the squirrels had a chance to swarm his body, small paper bags hit the ground nearby, showering the battlefield in mixed nuts, an unavoidable distraction. The squirrels scattered to obtain as many as they could. Cryptic looked up as he returned shakily to his feet. Vincent, Larry, and Xavier flew past and made a return to the house to grab more bags of nuts to drop. He rose his hand into the air as a thank you to the ducks for the help. The viciousness of the possums as they ripped and tore the squirrels apart startled Cryptic and made him glad his ducks had formed the alliance so many years ago. His shocked gaze out over the carnage was pulled back into focus by his chattering and barking club. Diving back into the fray, he swung wildly, connecting some squirrels to the flypaper and turning others into flying squirrels. Some of the tree rats clung to his clothes and climbed his body as he ran for the lady. Biting and clawing the entire way up his body, blood began to soak his clothes. A final pull on his straw depleted the rest of the moonshine in his hat. His body ached. His vision blurred. His balance waned. But he continued on. In his final few steps, he brought the squirrel-covered plastic leg over his head and swung down hard. Lady easily sidestepped him, since he had been imagining himself doing it in slow motion, and struck Cryptic in the head with a gnarled branch in her hand. He fell to his knees and saw the drink hat crash against the earth. The leg had also been knocked from his hands and wiggled along the ground as the attached squirrels attempted to get away. Without hesitation, Cryptic looked up at Lady and uppercut her between the legs. The old woman howled out in pain and dropped to the ground. As he rose to his feet, he grasped tightly to the ankle of the mannequin leg, once more raising the squirrel-encrusted club over his head. You know, I hate squirrels, lady. Accept your defeat and call your retreat. No one has touched me like that since my husband passed, lady said between cringes of pain. Fine, have it your... Wait, wait, what? Do it again. Harder, she said, as she began rising to her feet and rubbing all over her body in a very... erotic... manner. Are you coming on to me? Oh, hell no! Cryptic swung down hard and the squirrel's covered plastic thigh squeaked off of the old woman's head. She fell back, now rendered unconscious. With the fall of Lady, the squirrels almost immediately scattered, leaving behind only a few nuts, the bodies of the dead, triumphant possums, and a very confused cryptic. The moonshine began to take a heavy effect on him as he grabbed Lady by the ankle and drug her unconscious body towards the old woman's back door. By the time he got her close enough to open the door, he realized it was locked. By that time, her robes had bunched up around her armpits and covered her face. Cryptic gently set her foot on the edge of her back porch, told himself it was close enough, and then began his drunken stumble back to his house. He dropped his chattering club and it skittered off into the woods and up a tree. With no more squirrels in sight, he walked through the kitchen door and collapsed onto the chair. After taking a deep breath, the flap on the small doggy door swung open, and Gary, covered in drops of blood, trotted into the kitchen. You see, Gary... This is what happens when you feed squirrels. Little Weasel ignored his words and instead picked up the dish sponge and carried it back into the bedroom. As Cryptic watched him walk away, he realized the great squirrel migration was over. For now. Hey guys, it's still hot out, like unreasonably hot out. And you know what's great when it's unreasonably hot out? Iced tea. 
So if you guys like iced tea, check out Ivory Monocle Tea. Uh, that's my wife's uh, loose leaf tea thing she does on Etsy. Etsy.com slash shop slash Ivory Monocle Tea. You can get a whole bunch of different kinds of teas on there. They can be made hot if you're insane, or they could be made cold if you live anywhere near the equator. So check out Etsy.com slash shop slash Ivory Monocle Tea, and you can get a whole bunch of different kinds of teas from the fruity kind to the caffeinated kind to the kind that's named after creepypasta things, even one that's named after me, my dark and stormy night. And if you ask, when you order that tea, you can get a little MCP dabbing sticker along with it. Oh, also, I don't think I've ever mentioned this, but I sign all the cards if they're like horror related teas. So if you ever wanted that, Check that out. That's uh, the only, I guess, the only place you can get it now. <laughs> so yeah, check it out. Etsy.com slash shop slash Ivory Monocle Tea. And as always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. Thank you so much. A very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Reaper61167, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Kraus, Vicky McQuickie, Sam High, Crusader Chocobo, Spooky Shell, Adam Morris, Grand Moth the Milky, Big Smoke 369, Captain Scurvy, Salty Irish Poet, Esteban, Braden Morris, Nate Cull, Horror Fan 1212, Hour Minute Second Time, Kyle Resnack, David Martin, Scarrington the Unkempt, Robert Malcolm, Angelus, Spanky, Snoochie Boochie, Seclude, Lupita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Merxenum, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Catabaker, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob Like Sharp Things, Cryolinian, Xavier Graphius, Lord Life's Best, Goring Tramagasy, Maria Walker, Emily Mitchell, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limchok, Dirt Diver O3 Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Hidden Tiger, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Psychomel, Nana, The Leader Account, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Titanic Aries, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Sazaku, Cronut 509, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Benjamin Welverick, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. As always, thank you guys so, so much because you guys help me do everything that I do here. You guys help pay authors for stories and commission stories and do everything that I can do to make this channel and make this podcast the best it could possibly be. So thank you all for supporting me here. And as always, everyone, sweet dreams. <laughs>